Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Calvin Council is here tonight for public hearings. I will read the notice into the record. Call this meeting to order. Notice is hereby given that the Common Council of the City of Danbury will hold public hearings at which parties and interest and citizens will have the opportunity to be heard in relation to the following, copies of which are on file in the City Clerk's Office for public inspection. Number one, Snow Emergency Protocols, Code of Ordinance, Section 19-60. Number two, Removal of Private Debris, Code of Ordinance, Section 17-7. Number three, Danbury Bethel Interlocal Utilities Agreement. Number four, Sanitary Sewer Extension, Short Lombardi and Concord Streets. Number five, Historical Property Study, 254 Main Street as Historical Property. Said public hearings will be held on Monday, the 17th of November, 2008 at 7 p.m. in the Common Council Chambers in City Hall, 155 Deer Hill Avenue, Danbury, Connecticut, 06810, attested by Jean Natale, City Clerk. Members of the council will meet as a community of the whole immediately after the public hearing to take action on the same. Ladies and gentlemen, if uh, I'd like to just bring to your attention, uh, we had realized that there's a statutory limitation on constructing sewer projects that requires a 10-day notice. Um, and since that has happened, this, this notice was out publicly in a paper with only eight days notice. So we have moved item number three and item number four to next Monday, the night of the 20, Monday the 24th at 7 p.m. right here in the council chamber. So item three and four will be deferred to Monday the 24th and that has been posted in the news times as required by statute. Madam Clerk, or would you please call the roll? members present, five absent. Would the record please reflect, reflect that Mr. Trombetta is out of the country. Mr. Calandrino is trying to get back into the country. He's in Italy where there's a pilot strike. And uh, Mr. Perkins is working. Mr. Visconti has just arrived. And Mr. Seabury is doing his parent-teacher night at Denbury High School. Excuse me? Okay. I would ask any member of the public if you uh, would like to come up and address the council this evening to please say your name and spell your last name for the clerk so that we have a clear record of that and would you please also give us your address. Is there any member of the public wishing to address the council on item number one, snow emergency protocols, code of ordinance, section 19-60? Is there any member, sir? I have a Sir, if you would please come up forward to the microphone. Thank you. It's a different ordinance, sir. That's item number two. Uh, it's all right. What is this for? This is on snow, declaring a snow emergency within the city. What what dictates what's a snow emergency? Probably should just sit right up front. We'll probably be right there in a second. <laughs> is there any member, Mrs. Waller? Did you want to speak on item number one? Um, I'm not sure. I just heard. Okay. Item number one is the, the the declaration of a snow emergency in the city. And uh, item number two is about the ordinance regarding snow, debris, leaves, others. Okay. Any member of the public wish to address the council on item number one? 
Is there any member of the public who wishes to address the council on item number one? Any member of the public wish to address the council on item number one? Seeing none, we'll move to item number two. Item number two, removal of private debris, code of ordinance section 17-7. Is there any member of the public that wishes to address the council on item number two, sir? If you could just speak into the microphone, because we all can hear. Then we. Um, this is regarding I heard on the radio about plowing into the streets during a snowstorm. Now I have done that in the past, but I never leave it in the streets. I mean, there's sometimes it's impossible to, you know, do your plowing. I'm not in the business of plowing, but I, I run a business and I own a couple of rental properties. Now when I plow into the street. I, you know, come sideways and plow it back toward the curb. Now, is this going to be not allowed anymore? Or? Well, Mr. Mitchell, we do not answer questions during this phase. We will do questions in the uh, committee to hold immediately following the public hearing, right. and we certainly will ask that question to. Right, that's what I'm concerned the about. Director of Public Sometimes Works and Council. Not do that. All right. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Mrs. Waller, on item number two. My name is Lynn Waller, 83 Highland Avenue, Danbury, Connecticut. I don't really have a problem with the snow portion of it. Actually, I think it's a really good idea as several of my ex-neighbors are no longer there, used to plow their stuff into my yard, and I think that's wrong. Uh, but I'm concerned about the removal of debris, partly because when you live in Center City, Danbury, there's an awful lot of residents that just go by and heave things. And that ends up leaving it on my property in downtown Danbury. We get tires, we get mattresses, we get things that aren't ours. I don't know what to do with them, and I certainly don't want to have to pay to take somebody else's debris away. So that's one of my concerns when you say you can't put them out on the road because maybe the city workers would pick them up. Somebody certainly doesn't have any compunction about dropping them on my place. So uh, I'm concerned about that. But I'm also concerned about the leaves. I'm not sure how you can put this ordinance in and find people for pushing leaves out into the road when there are several roads in Danbury that have special services that get vacuumed uh, when the rest of us have to put everything into bags. I know West Worcester Street just was done, Pleasant Street, Deer Hill Avenue. They just rake everything out into the street and then the city trucks come around and vacuum everything up. And I don't think it's fair for the rest of us to be fined if we do that. And I don't happen to do that. We compost, so we use all the leaves that fall on our property. You want some more? Yeah, my husband will take more. <laughs> Not in any quantity, but yes. Uh, actually, we get them from the neighbor's property also. But um, I, I'm really concerned why you would be able to give a ticket to someone for doing that when some of the residents in Danbury get free services from the city the rest of us are not privy to. So I thought I'd bring that up, and especially with the fine going up to $100 to have this happen. 90, Ms. Muller, but yes. Oh, all right. It's not this fine sheet that was on here that says 100 No, actually, the ordinance itself has a specific fine in it for $90. Okay. Okay. Well, even $90, I think, may be a little extensive. Um, and you also can't, you can't control where God puts the leaves, so sometimes they just plain blow out into the street. But I also see why you're trying to do this, because I went around this weekend when it was raining so hard, and every one of the down drains were just clogged with leaves. So I can understand the point from both sides. I just wanted to bring it up. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public that wishes to address the council on item number two? Mrs. Basso? Pauline Basso, 8 Hoyt Street, Danbury, Connecticut. First of all, we have not only plows plowing into the streets, we also have snow blowing, blowing into the streets. That is blocking the traffic. That's making it hard for the 
uh, plow guys also. Um, another thing is I do meet with a lot of people who tell me that they do snow plowing in the winter time. If they have no place to put the snow in the backyard, they have to bring it to the front. I think what they should be allowed to do is once they bring it to the front, continue down the street and take it to the side until it's in a good place where it can be uh, disposed of properly. I did talk to a couple of the drivers and they said that this is what a lot of them do do. I used to have one across the street from me who would plow the driveway and push it into my neighbor's um, yard and cover her side, uh, sidewalk. Um, but a lot of the, but now that I stand on the porch, he does come out and he continues down the road where it's clear, where there's no cars, and he'll deposit it as he goes down the road. And I think that should be um, taken into consideration. Now, um, there's a lot of nights when I'm sitting in my living room and I'm watching TV and there's snow out in the yard. I mean, snow outside. About maybe 10, 30, 11 o'clock, I hear ice hitting my front porch. The plow guy comes down and goes a little bit too fast, and he's throwing the ice that's on the road up onto my porch, which is a good 15 feet away from the street and the curb. Okay. Um, I also feel that the leaves that Lynn said should be included in this ordinance also, because I see an awful lot of contractors blowing the leaves into the street. Now, where she's talking about Deer Hill, Pleasant Street, Othiella, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, they're all picked up. But if the people don't get their leaves out on the day that the city comes by with a sucker to pick them up, then they have to do it a couple days later, and they bring them out, and they leave them there until either the city comes back and picks them up, or they're going to be there all winter long. Now, what happens then is that if you have the... Uh, leaves that are outside and they're not picked up and they do start to it starts to rain or we have water what happens is the water will back up ice forms and then we have a sheet of ice and I think that's where a lot of the uh, drivers I have to go back for the overtime because they have to do the sanding and everything else also I want to know Who's going to pay for this? Is it going to be the homeowner or is it going to be the plow, plow person? Because you know what happens is that if this is put out there and they don't know who did it, but they know it came from the house across the street or a particular house, then who are we going to uh, find the homeowner? And I don't think the homeowner should be fined, but if the homeowner is fined, I think he's going to either get a new plow guy or tell the plow guy he can't do it anymore because it's going to be a warning because they know the first one's going to be a warning and then after that it's the fine. I think this is going to be very hard to enforce. It's like a lot of our <laughs> laws. They're very, very hard to enforce, but it's something that really has to be done because this is a big problem out there. I do know that myself, I mean, I'm 70 years old and I shovel my own sidewalk. I can't get my guy to come down anymore because... He, did, he used to do it for me, but I don't have the young kid. And I'm 70 years old, but when my plow guy even goes down and he plows my, drive, my, my street, he fills in my driveway, uh, my uh, sidewalk all the time. I have to go out like 1.30, o'clock in the morning, and I have to keep shoveling my sidewalk. This, to me, is ridiculous. We've got to find a way that we can actually have the snow in the city center pushed to the side so that it doesn't go on. My brother used to plow, and he said... It can be done, but what's happening now, I have a neighbor in my neighborhood who is in her 80s, and she also has a problem with a snow, blow, snow plow guy is putting it all into her uh, sidewalk. So, I mean, this is, this is a problem. So, I mean, what we've got to do is we've got to think of it both ways, both the plow guy, us, and the city. Let's all take a responsibility, and let's do it right. Thanks, guys Thank and women. Is there any other member of the public that wishes to address the council on item number two? Any other member of the public wishing to address the council on item number two? Any member of the public wishing to address the council on item number two? And seeing none, we'll move on to item number five. Historical property study, 254 Main Street as historic property. 
Is there any member of the public wishing to address the council on item five? Good evening. Hi, I'm Lori. I'm Dr. Lori Weinstein from Western Connecticut State University. I also live at 44 Concord Road in Danbury. Uh, <clears throat> just to give you a little background on this, back in 19 in 2002, I met with uh, Mayor Bowton about becoming a certified local government program. And the certified local government program is administered through the National Park Association. And what this does is it allows various municipalities throughout the country to apply for federal monies to help restore and preserve historic properties. Mayor Bowton and Mike McLaughlin were all, were all on board for this and they all thought this was a great idea. So we started uh, sort of moving by fits and uh, starts with getting this going and thanks to the wonderful help of Dennis Elpern and Robin Edwards, uh, I'm now before you today. So it's made all the committee processes. It's gone from creating a study committee uh, back in early part of 2002, 2003. We submitted a report to the Connecticut Commission on Culture and Tourism. They adopted and endorsed our plan. We held a public hearing in May of 2008. We reported to the Common Council in June of uh, this year. It then went to an ad hoc committee, and the ad hoc committee issued a report on 10-2208 recommending a public hearing on adopting the historic property ordinance. So now I'm here before you. And I do have pictures of the one property that we hope if I can give these to you. What we want to do is start with the old library building in downtown. I've been there many times with Mike McLaughlin and the mayor, as well as people from the Certified Local Government Program up in Hartford. And we want to restore the uh, murals that were done there. They were painted by Charles Fetter. Um, we thought this was a WPA program, but it actually isn't, but they were painted in the 1930s. If any of you have been to the old library, you'll see those murals. They're really, really beautiful. It's now the music building and the murals desperately need to be restored. So becoming a certified local government would enable us to apply for monies to restore these murals. In addition, we hope to look at other properties, historic properties in Danbury, apply for monies to help preserve and restore uh, some of our historic properties. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very Any much. Questions or comments? We don't usually, we do not answer questions in this, okay. part, in this phase of the hearing, but thank you. Okay, sure. You're welcome to stay for the Committee of the Whole. There may be a question for you there. Is there any other member of the public that wishes to address the council on item number five? Any member of the public wishing to address the council on item number five? Any member of the public wishing to address the council on item number five? Yeah. Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. To, we have a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Seconded by Ms. Heischoltz. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Public hearing is closed. We will now open the committee of the whole. I would ask the clerk if she would please take the roll again. <coughs> Present. right before the public hearing as well as the committee of the whole. Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen of the council, on item number one, snow emergency protocols, what's your pleasure? Mrs. Teicholtz. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to make a motion to amend code of ordinances section 19-60 as recommended by the ad hoc committee, which amends Amendments clarify the definition of snow emergency to allow for coordinated public works operations and snow emergency protocols during such emergencies. Second. Motion is made by Mrs. Teicholz and seconded by Mr. Nagersheth. Under discussion? Mr. Rattel? Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through the Chair to Corporation Council. Um, Attorney Pinner, it says here in the... Uh, First paragraph, uh, no vehicle shall be permitted to park or remain stationary on any city street or highway so as to obstruct, hinder, or otherwise delay snow and ice control operations. And then in the second line it says, as defined herein. And I don't actually see the definition of a snow emergency. Is there a, is that based on a predicted snowfall amount, like a half an inch, a dusting, a flurry, it's not going to be an emergency, but if they're calling for three or four inches, that would be, is, is that basically how it works? Well, that's, that's one of the changes or amendments in the ordinance, Paul. The, uh, that is declared uh, when the mayor, together with the public works director, issues that emergency and when plow vehicles are dispatched. So that's the kicker. Whether it's a, a half an inch or an inch or two, the kicker is not the amount of the snow as much as when the mayor, together with the public works director, deems it to be uh, a dispatch time for the plows. And that's what, that's what, if you look below, the second to the last paragraph is is, is, is the reason for the clarification, so that kind of uncertainty is, is addressed. That's when, um, now if you adopt this, now by law you'll know when that's to be declared. Okay, if I may have follow up. So what you're saying is that when the mayor and the director of the public works decide that there's going to be a snow emergency, that's, that's basically when it starts. Right. Could the plows be called out without declaring a snow emergency also? Uh, the reason I ask is it's a, if you have tenants or you know, you, maybe you don't have a lot of parking or something like that, it's a pretty big inconvenience for the people downtown to play musical parking spaces every time it starts to snow. So I'm thinking that there obviously are, are many occasions when we don't get that much snow when you don't necessarily have to completely clear the streets in order for the uh, main thoroughfares to be uh, policed properly. So w w is there a possibility to call out public works without declaring? In other words, so somewhat of a level below a snow yeah, exactly. emergency. Yeah. I think the, the public works director has some jurisdiction and, and would have jurisdiction in that kind of case. Uh, the snow emergencies typically are declared when there's, there's a, a easy word emergency is used, so that means uh, some uh, risk to life and limb. So something below that standard uh, he has discretion, I would say, to uh, let a plow out or plows out in those circumstances. But um, the reason that this has been amended is to provide sort of a line of demarcation for uh, plows to be dispatched and for vehicles to be uh, taken off the roads. Um, you know, the, the dispatch of vehicles by itself um, I think that's probably allowable and assumed, even where there isn't a snow emergency. But where where that level would be is something that um, I think you know the public works director would probably have to determine based on those circumstances. But well, I, I, let me put it this way: the safer approach would be to, um, if the if snow begins to fall. Okay, the coordination begins between the public works director and the mayor, and when they decide that trucks are dispatched, that's when vehicles have to be removed from the road. In cases where you don't necessarily need to remove vehicles, that would be that lower tier. So I, I would say that the public works director can make that decision uh, where vehicles don't have to be removed from the road. Uh, again, it's a discretionary call, I would say. But I just want to be clear on this. Every single time we get some frozen precipitation does not necessarily mean for the people watching at home that there's going to be that that this ab automatically institutes a snow emergency. Correct. And people have to change their whole plans for the day to figure out where they're going to park at the school or the firehouse or whatever. That's yes, correct? that's correct. Okay. See, right now is the way it is pre-ordinance change. 
there's three levels of protocol uh, and the mayor declares those. So the lowest level is maybe something where it's, it's a little bit of snow, but it does present some level of risk. Um, and that's probably the area you're talking about. This tries to separate it into a clear emergency and then the lower tier would be what you're talking about. So I think Thank that's you. allowed. Mrs. Stanley? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question uh, to Attorney uh, Pinter, um, would there be some kind of announcement made to the public which would totally, I mean, it would make it totally clear of, you know, what is, when it's, when it's needed and when it's not. I mean, obviously there's already a question here. That, that, I mean, I know sometimes we get those announcements over the phone, we get those recorded messages. Well, uh, that, the question of notification did come up during the committee meeting, and there, there is a procedure um, where a snow emergency is declared. It would be the, the system that's presently used for that kind of notification to the public, a, a reverse 911, I guess it is, system where uh, the public is notified that a snow emergency has been declared. I assume that will be used. That's the notification we're talking about. So that's what that's what the public needs to when they get that notification. That's when this falls into place. Or that that's one element of it. The other element of it is that when you see snow plows out, you can probably assume that a snow emergency may have been declared. Uh, but I think you have to tie those two together. You got to get the notification somehow. People have to have to know. Uh, either by virtue of a reverse 911 notification or some other notification. And when you see the plows start... Or even the start, radio. Sometimes they say it on the radio. Well, when the snow emergency is declared, uh, someone will get on some means of broadcast, uh, either on the radio or on a reverse 911 system, to provide notification that an emergency has been declared. So that's the notification that people get. But just one more follow-up. You just said that if it starts to snow, we should just be aware of it. I mean, I, I just want to make it clear for who's ever watching or ever has, you know, that question. Should I move my car? Should I not move my car? You, you have I'm to move I'm still your... not clear myself, and I'm sitting right here asking a question. Right. Um, the, um, the reason for the snow, snow emergency protocol is uh, really for plowing. If you see us wearing our iron, which is basically the plows are coming on, that's really when we start having problems going down narrow streets with cars being parked on both sides. So uh, typically if we're just sanding, everything's good. And we get through a lot of storms just by sanding. It's when the iron goes on the truck where the 11 foot plow with the snow foil ends up being 12 foot wide. We just can't get down some of the streets. At that point, I would be contacting the mayor and recommending to him that he declare a snow emergencies. The snow emergency goes right over to radio stations. Actually, some of the TV stations actually announce it and um, reverse 911. So there is a very um, uh, detailed process of notification to the public. But if you are out driving around and your car radio doesn't work or you don't have a TV, um, if you start to see the trucks wearing their iron, that means you, you really should probably not be parking on the street because there'll be a snow emergency called probably within the next half hour to an hour. Thank you. Ms. McMahon? I have a question for Antonio again. Sorry to roll it. Um, Antonio, when the snow emergency is over, is there some other type of notification to say that it's over so people can go back out on the street? Usually it's after the streets have been pushed back and you'll, you'll see when we come through and push, push the snow back, it, usually it's after the storm has stopped. Um, um, it's pretty clear when we're done snow plowing because everything's usually pushed back and you can almost see the gutter of the road. Um, we never really discussed having an official notification saying the emergency is over because people are... Uh, they're pretty good about saying, hey, you know what, the road's completely clear now, I can park on the street. Um, Just one thing, uh, when the snow emergency is over, I work down at the Patriot Garage, so they are allowed to park there during a snow emergency, mm -hmm. but what happens when the snow emergency is over, they don't take their cars out, they leave them there. 
And so that's a, mm -hmm. a bit of a problem too, if there was maybe some sort of way to, because a lot of people don't know to move their cars, so they'll leave them for the whole day, even overnight to the next day, mm -hmm. and then decide to. So they, they don't use their car their for a couple days after they park them there? It depends. It, some people don't. Uh, sometimes it's couples. One will drop one car off, leave one there. So we have found that cars stay longer than they really should. And then, you know, we give them, you know, they don't charge when it's a snow emergency uh, to park in the garage. But that was just a question. If there was some way to notify. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think uh, it would be a problem to just use that same media to kind of tell people that the sm snow emergency is over. Um, if it becomes a real issue, I guess, with uh, people not being aware that, you know, we're done plowing. And some people, I guess, just don't realize it, and they just, you know, there are cars there. I think some people are just taking advantage of the free parking, actually. If it's what it yeah. Is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Agrawal. Mr. Tinis. All right, thank you. I do the chair to Corporation Council. I, I think we touched upon it to other council members this evening. I would like to see some type of, of communication clause in the ordinance. So upon a declaration, it's clear that the mayor shall do X, Y, and Z. And also, I don't see where there should be a designated parking area. Because a lot of times when you do declare an area, a, a, a snow emergency, people just don't know where they could park. For example, I know they could park in the Patriot, the Patriot Garage, the new uh, Liberty Street Garage, but what about City Hall? Can they park there? Can they park in the school lots? Park like Park Avenue, because a lot of cars are parked on Park Avenue. Could they park in other areas while the streets are being plowed and then they can do it vice versa when those areas are clear? I don't think people know where to park in certain areas where they, this is not a place for them to park. Because I know in, 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 on Long Park Avenue, there's a lot of cars that park along Park Avenue, which would have to be removed because it's on public right away. And some other areas, but where they're going to park if they can't park in the, on, the, on the street, where do they park? And I think that's part of the problem that you see here when there is an emergency. I think people need, just need to know where they can go. And I think that'll make this, this ordinance even better if it's, it's better worded with there, the communication clause or designated parking areas where they could go. And then that could be amended time to time as there's more areas that come about. Mr. Pinter, I may be able to help you with that, possibly. I'll, I'll take first shot at it and then if you'll go. Uh, sure. Ms. Chinese, I know that in the past several years, when the announcements have been made on WLAD and 98Q that there's a snow emergency in Danbury, they offer the alternate sites of parking right in along with the same statement. When the mayor issues his release, he issues his release with the alternative parking sites when he does that every time that he's done that, that I know of. So he is, he is and has been doing that right along, along with the Director of Public Works. And, and part two of that might be that um, the amendment of this ordinance before you is an attempt to kind of take step one of clarifying and defining what a snow emergency is. Um, if we, we can, if we want to expand the ordinance even further to specify these um, details, that certainly can be done. The problem with that is you may have to keep changing or amending it over time. One of the uh, changes to the ordinance is that it defines or it sets forth a protocol that the officials will establish. And that protocol uh, would include things like where you can put a car. Protocol includes uh, the other details, uh, how long you keep it there, uh, things like that. So. One of the reasons a lot of ordinances don't have that level of detail is because then you'd be changing the ordinance every every other month when there's another good idea that comes along. So to a certain extent, the discretion that's provided in the ordinance is to allow officials to establish regulations, if you will, protocol to um, to do things like you're suggesting. But to put it in here would, 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 would could be done, but it would be a little bit difficult. And the follow-up, but wouldn't it make sense to have it written somewhere, because if I knew if it's going to be a, a snow emergency, I can park there immediately without waiting to get the emergency. If I knew there's a big storm coming, I would know ahead of time where I need to go, well, instead of waiting to do it. Yeah, the, the uh, understood. And there is presently, as they say, a, a three-level 
uh, declaration that's out there, and Antonio could address that in a little more detail than I can, but I think that in that established procedure, which is adjusted over time, there are details that are provided to the public as to what, where they can go, what they can do. Uh, if, if the council wants to put that in the ordinance, uh, that, that would be, that'd be possible. But again, it's more in the way of a regulation, which typically you don't want to, you could have an ordinance that's two pages long, and then you'd be, again, you'd be changing it when you want to change a garage or a parking area or other things like that. So you, you could do it, but the, the establishment of a protocol is referred to in here. You're kind of trusting the folks with the, with the uh, duties to take care of that. One of the things that Mr. Shadi just mentioned to me too is that it certainly can be posted on the city's website and public can go to the city's website and I'm sure that the mayor's office and the director of public works would have no problem doing that, so. Okay. Is there anything, Mr. Visconti? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, through the chair to uh, Attorney Pinter. Uh, you explained this very well, but is in your opinion, your personal opinion, or your opinion, uh, is it really needed to be put in, in writing into a doctrine like this or uh, we can listen to it on the radio, reverse 911, the TV, and, and so on and so on. It's in the papers uh, quite often where people can park or they can't park. And, and basically, I, I think I've also read it, what a snow emergency is all about and when it's declared. So do we really need to put something to that effect where you can park or not park into the, in, in, and keep going in this thing? Uh, legally, I don't suggest it because it's it's so uh, changeable. It's so uh, it's subject to change on a regular basis, depending depending upon the circumstances. You could have certain conditions that demand some kind of action, other conditions that demand a different kind of action. So again, if you if you do put detail like that in the ordinance, you, you're likely to be you likely to have problems with that uh, when issues come up that either are addressed or are not addressed by that. Uh, expanded ordinance. So the answer I would give you is I would not suggest that I let the officials that are charged with this task who already have certain protocol in place to leave them to establish the right protocol under those circumstances that come up. Um, Mrs. Stanley? Thank you, Mr. President. So am I understanding this correctly? This sounds to me more like this is an, an administrative procedure needed because for the years in the past, we get the reverse 911 calls, we hear about it on the radio. So is this something that's being done internally? Because we do get notifications. Yes, it is. Uh, so was it, what's the, I, I don't see where the difference is. It seems like this has already been happening. The difference is that now you have, you have a, um, if you will, a starting gate for when a snow emergency is declared. And the starting gate is that the public works director, together with the mayor and the dispatch of the vehicles, is the declaration of a snow emergency. That's the Certainly. kicker. That's not in there right now. Right now, there's a three-step process, a three-level, which the mayor declares in consultation with the public works director. But you don't have it codified as this change has it now. So it's very clear to the public, here's when a snow emergency is declared subject to Councilman Rotello's possible lower tier before the chains go on. But when a snow emergency is declared, now people know how it's declared. Okay. It's very clear. That's that's really the, the main difference so, here. So it, it is an, an, an administrative procedure, basically. Be, behind the declaration it is. In other words, the declaration is you're approving it if you do that. Below that, the administrative procedure is put in place by others. That's not in here. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else on item number one? Seeing none, I'll try your minds. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. Item number two, removal of private debris, code of ordinance, section 17-7. What's your pleasure, counsel? Mr. Arcanti. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to amend the code of ordinance to section 17-7 by the addition of subsections G and H, providing for restrictions and fines for illegal placement of materials upon public property from private properties in accordance with said provisions. Second. Motion was made and seconded by Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. We'll get to Mrs. McMahon again. 
Any discussion, Mr. Riley? Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I'm a little concerned with this ordinance. Um, and I'd like to state some reasons why. Um, it seems to me that on this particular ordinance that we're making a mountain out of a molehill. Um, most likely, and I'm pretty sure anyway, that there are state statutes that already address this issue. I would imagine that when it comes to uh, removal, that there's already laws on the books. Thirdly, do we need? Do we really need to hamper the police department with with this issue? As it is, every time we turn around, we're writing an ordinance. Think about this way: that every time we write an ordinance, it it in essence becomes law. This particular one would would involve the police department to the point where they are going to get involved with issues that can be settled with using just common sense rather than having the police go out and have to settle an argument. As it is, those that plow, I mean, for the, all the years I've been around, there's been many of them, when the plow comes down the street, they blow it into my driveway. It's been done for years and years and years. I take it and I throw it back on the side, and it's not a big deal. If my neighbor does something like that, I go over and talk to the neighbor. He talks to me, she talks to me, and we get it done. We are getting into the habit of every time we turn around, we blow our nose, we're going to write an ordinance. Next thing you know, we're going to have an ordinance for young, young guys that wear their trousers a little bit below the navel and showing their shorts, we're going to write an ordinance on it. I think that we're overstepping our bounds, and I think that we got to stop writing ordinance on silly little things like this. These are common sense issues, and we don't need to have an ordinance on this, and we don't have to uh, put more, more emphasis on the chief and his staff and his police to do more and more and more. I think that we're going too far. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, before we go any further, I think I'd like to take the opportunity to call Mr. Iadarola up to explain, give the council a little bit of background on this, and um, just maybe answer some of Mr. Riley's concerns um, in regards to the the issuing authority, who, has, who will have the issuing authority in this ordinance, and maybe Mr. Pinter can help out with that as well. But uh, Antonio, if you would just come up and kind of brief the council. I know you briefed us as an ad hoc committee, and um, you know a lot of members were not there at the ad hoc, so it may be helpful for them to hear it directly from you what the issue is. Sure, thank you. Um, Mr. Riley um, is correct about one thing, and that is uh, you would think common sense uh, would be the driving force from somebody uh, plowing snow, sometimes three, four feet high, and blocking a complete lane of a city street. Unfortunately, that common sense does not uh, prevail. Um, and because there's the motive uh, from anybody that's in the business of plowing snow is uh, you got a lot of accounts, sometimes a truck breaks down, and you got to cover these accounts, and you do uh, whatever you need to do to get these individual commercial properties or individual property owners cleaned up and uh, sometimes the city is left with the burden of cleaning up the residual snow um, and we're not worried about a little wind road that's left we're talking about where sometimes i have to send a uh, loader out to open up a street so that's kind of what's driving this uh, last year and what we've noticed is a significant increase in this issue over the years last year was probably one of the worst years that the department says they've seen in a long time. Uh, there were two accidents last year that were related to um, a large wind roll of snow that was left in the road. Uh, a gentleman came around a corner, uh, saw the wind roll, hit the brakes, couldn't stop quick enough, went into the wind roll and almost flipped his car over. Um, so it does become a significant issue and it is something that over the probably the last number of years we've just been dealing with to the point now where we feel we have to kind of 
uh, let the public uh, know or let these individual business owners know that if this continues, there may be a fine. Um, and we don't expect to issue fine um, every time it happens. Uh, what we would like to uh, be able to do is uh, tell the property owner that uh, this can't go on anymore and uh, we're going to give them one more chance at talking to their contractor to fix the issue. Uh, if it continues, uh, then I think that uh, we should be able to issue the, uh, uh, the fine. Uh, a lot of this fine, um, a lot of the issuance of the fine we hope to just be able to do internally within the Public Works Department. We have that authority on a number of other issues um, uh, and ordinances. We do have the power to issue uh, um, tickets, uh, so we hope not to burden the police department with those issues. Although every time we have an issue significant to what I just described, the police department's there. Uh, because there's an accident or somebody's going off the road or uh, people can't pass and somebody calls the police department and says, well, I can't get through because there's a pile of snow in the middle of the road, so they're there. Um, but um, that's what's driving the issue. It's, it's been more and more and more of a significant issue. And um, what you're seeing is other communities really implementing the same type of ordinances in their bylaws. And uh, uh, we're uh, probably second to a couple of local uh, towns, surrounding towns that have already done this. Um, and it's for the same reasons for what I just described. Thank you, Mr. Ayanarola. We'll go with Mr. Curran, and then we'll come this way, Mr. Sadi. Chairman, I don't know who to address this to, but Mrs. Waller and Mrs. Uh, <clears throat> Basso brought it up, and it's something I always wonder about. Why do some, some streets get to blow their leaves into the street and get picked up by the city and nobody else does? I mean, I like what, what, how do I get on that list? <laughs> uh, could you explain that to me? Um, it's not a special service, it's not based on who lives on what street. Um, a number of years ago, and I'm probably going back 20 years ago, um, there was a maybe an unwritten policy, but there are a number of streets, uh, for example, Deer Hill, that have a significant number of city-owned trees that are right along the gutter. And um, a, a decision was made many years ago that um, it was unfair to have those individual property owners be burdened with the removal of that magnitude of leaves. Um, so the city said, because of our trees basically littering the streets and a portion of the properties, uh, what we will do is pick up those leaves on those streets. And that's the reason why it's done. Um, it's, it's a way to be fair to some of the residents that live on these streets where you have a significant amount of city-owned trees, which really um, significantly drop a uh, significant amount of leaves on private property and the cities right away. That counted eight significance there, Mr. Ayanrola. Mr. Sadi? Mr. President, I have a couple of questions. First one, through uh, the chair to uh, Corporation Council. With regard to subsection E and specifically the imposition of responsibility upon passage of this ordinance for uh, abutting property owners to take care of sidewalks, and then specifically stating that they have a particular level of care to give to them, and then an issue of liability and proximate causation. I understand we can, under our um, police powers, mandate that people have to maintain in a certain level, you know, sidewalks next to the property. But I have an issue of dictating and going into issues of proximate causation, levels of liability and a standard of care that is required to be shown to others as opposed to just maintaining. Is that from statute or case law? It, it is from both statute and case law. I reviewed many of those cases and, and, and that language is actually used regularly to try to determine liability. If I may, but is that a municipality imposing that or is that already in common law? And if it's in common law and case law, why are we putting it in an ordinance and not just simply allowing people if they get injured to sue based on public in, uh, um, uh, uh, personal injury uh, case law. Oh, uh, Tom, are you talking about the part of the ordinance that's already been in, in place for uh, whatever number of years? I'm, I'm just looking at the language. I don't know specifically because it's not uh, called out specifically what is and what is not new in sub E. I'm looking at E, 
specifically. Okay. Yeah, EE is a section that's already existed. That this 17-7 uh, is uh, was enacted by the council years ago by virtue of a of a state legislation, as you know. And that piece of legislation does uh, specify, and the case law behind that statute does talk about proximate cause throughout. Okay, that's fine. So that's why that E is there. That's and that's in existence now. And with regard to sub G, from what we've heard tonight, it seems that the the real pushing, uh, the real incentive here is to address the issue of snow. I have a significant problem with you have snow, ice, sand, or debris. Debris could be anything. It could be me sweeping the end of my driveway and, and a few things go into the street. There's no requirement here that it obstruct anything. Um, and what about the temporary placing? Uh, one thing that I was discussing with people is when I uh, lived in a previous property along a fairly busy street, at times when I was removing the leaves and trimming hedges and such, I'd have to temporarily put them in the street, line it up, and then go down and collect it all. Now, I know as a practical matter, we're not going to send people out to ticket people doing that, but that, if I read this strictly, is prohibited. It doesn't say for any length of time. It doesn't say we shall, you know, in any way obstructs. And if the real impetus here is to address the issue of snow, maybe we can tighten this up a little bit. And I put that both to you from a legal standpoint as well as a practical standpoint to the Director of Public Works. Well, if I get my part first, I'll address that, Tom, that uh, this uh, request came to us in order to solve uh, a couple of particular problems. And, it, and the generic problem is that people we're putting certain items, sweeping or shoveling or casting, if you will, into the street, things from their own properties or from the sidewalks. And it was causing a hazard or potentially would cause a hazard uh, for the public travelways, whether it be the road or, or, or other travelways. Um, in order to try to deal with this at the first bite, uh, we uh, looked at some language in surrounding communities and uh, Brookfield, for example, had adopted recently a, uh, an ordinance like this. And some of the language is taken from there. They were fairly generic, too, because as um, Councilman Riley suggested, uh, you know, when you go too overboard, you, you're liable to never get to the end if you start defining everything. So what, what we tried to do, at least as an initial look, was to give you the general um, idea of what the city did not want to happen and through the forces and the um, reasonable discretion of the departments, uh, you know, we'd work through it and come up with solutions to these kinds of issues. But this, the specificity that we could put in there, similar to what Mr. Cinesi, Councilman Cinesi said before, we could, we could go to all ends and G could be as long as the entire ordinance. It would be difficult to do, but that's certainly uh, within your authority to suggest more definition, but we didn't do it at the initial bite. To follow up with that, I, I understand the concern with over-legislating and taking away protocols and administrative implementation procedures from the departments that would have jurisdiction over this, but also there is a problem when you do, as you said, almost generically legislate where the generic uh, statements can be looked at as being ambiguous and ambiguities themselves can sweep in so many other things, and I, you know, excuse the pun, uh, into an ordinance. So what I was thinking of is something along the lines of uh, not over-legislating this and defining every particular circumstance that can and cannot occur under this ordinance, but something that may state obstructs the public thoroughfare or in a manner that obstructs or otherwise causes an obstruction. Uh, so that it is not somebody literally sweeping some leaves into the street and then you get a neighbor and there's a property. These guys have had a dispute for years and they're going and and calling on the police to cite someone, and then getting upset when they're not cited. But the, the issue here seems, as the Director of Public Works pointed out, it's an issue of safety and obstruction. It's not an issue of, as you said, a little bit of snow maybe tracking into the street, but people leaving piles, people causing uh, a dangerous situation. Now, just thinking out of the box here, something along the lines that, you know, maybe at the end of sub G or wherever it would uh, be uh, more appropriately inserted, uh, the words that obstruct uh, any portion thereof relating to the public highway, sidewalk, or other public property. 
Uh, and that's, that's fine, Tom, but uh, remember too that there's, uh, there are other um, available remedies to obstructing public travel ways. And so, you know, if, if, a, if, if a review of an incident were to occur by a city official, they would look at not only this section, but also look at 1225 and the littering sections also to try to come to a, a, a decision about whether a penalty is, uh, is deserved or not. So the obstruction issues uh, are entertained in 1225. Which I think goes back to what Councilman Riley brought up in that aren't these covered under other ordinances that we do have and to the extent are we trying to address something that's not covered. So if obstructions to the road are covered and we're not trying to address that, what are we trying to address? We're trying, we're trying to address something, it, it is somewhat different. Here's how it's different. The obstructionist travel is, for example, someone putting a um, an old television set uh, on the okay. portion of the grass between the sidewalk and the road and the t TV set hangs over one or the other. This uh, is intended, because it's put in a section 17-7, it really talks about active removal, uh, or casting or causing things to be shoveled or, uh, or raked or pushed into uh, the road or, or into the side or into the road by uh, private property owners. In, in, in a way that covers the entire, if you will, the front length of their property, for example. The, the other ordinance that we were talking about is really more for isolated placement of obstructions. So th th there is some overlap, but this, because of where it's placed in this particular section, is intended to be more of a, well, the guy's you know, shoveling there for the last two hours, putting stuff into the road, so now there's a whole row of leaves. It does obstruct, but it's kind of a different cause of the obstruction. Oh, and and then go back to my concern. It's almost uh, it's like a catch-all, um, and maybe obstruct is too stringent a word to use. Uh, you know, in any way impact travel of the thoroughfare or safety. But uh, I, you know, I'll 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 yield to others. I don't want to take up too much time on this. But I no, no councilman, you're you're right. And, and lawyers, as you know, we we certainly can we happily. Uh, Reamend a little bit to clarify if that's the wish of the council to alleviate any concerns like that. That's that would not be a problem to do that. Well, and just while others are speaking, I'm just going to jot down some uh, possible language. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Levy. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I have a, a problem as well with this ordinance. I I can't cite the uh, the legal reasons, but uh, the uh, the rationale of of common sense, and I think there this has been a problem in the city of Danbury for a long, long time, um, and it's probably uh, certain individuals that are not considerate of others that violate this this kind of common sense rule as far as putting uh, some kind of hazard in the roadway, and I I really think it is in fact a police action when you see uh, consistently. A, uh, a violator, someone who's putting hazards in the road, um, and they should be uh, fined appropriately or s cited in one way or another. Uh, I realize that uh, during a snowstorm, uh, the deeper the snow, the more the problem. Uh, everybody has that problem. Where do you put the, your snow shelf? Uh, it gets full, and where do you put the snow? And if you have three, four feet on the ground, which is not uncommon, I guess we're all going to take the ordinance and throw it to the wind because we're just going to do what we have to do to survive. Um, so I, I see that as a problem and I also, the bigger problem is that if somebody hires an individual to do their snow plowing, uh, I can't see why the homeowner should be responsible. If somebody is in the business of plowing snow, they should be fully aware of what uh, good common sense and the laws are, in fact. Uh, when it gets to debris in general, I've seen people put leaves down the sewer drain. They, they, they pack it solid. And, and, and those are not very good citizens. They're, not, they're uh, not very conscientious about our community. And I think that, uh, in fact, uh, the people that are issuing it, according to this, it's the public works director or his designee, um, I'm not sure that uh, a, I would have a snowplow operator who is uh, putting uh, uh, 14 hours on the road, who's is working very hard, uh, 
uh, given that responsibility to give out summons. I, you know, it gets pretty tough when you're out there during a bad snowstorm. So I, I, I also have a problem in that area. I, I think that um, this can be best dealt with uh, through the existing state statutes uh, that the, uh, the police department can handle to their best ability. Uh, and I realize they're, they're under a lot of strain, especially during a snowstorm when there's a lot of accidents and things of that nature. But we all have to pull together. And uh, like I say, those individuals who are habitual violators of, of the laws of common sense, and then they should be uh, cited. Uh, and they should be uh, uh, given summons uh, accord in accordance to putting hazards in roadways. And if you temporarily put a, a somebody plows their driveway and temporarily puts snow out there until they have a chance to put it on the side bank, uh, who's to say a car can't come along during that finite period of time and get into an accident and claim, well, the law clearly states that you can't do that. You can't plow snow on the road. Um, it only takes a short period of time for someone to, to get in an accident, and they're going to say, well, the ordinance says that that homeowner put his snow on, on the roadway and caused my accident and, and based some kind of litigation on what should have been common sense of a driver driving in hazardous weather, and that is be careful. Um, you don't know whether you're going to have a snow drift or what the case is going to be. So I just I understand the the uh, the motivation from the highway department, from the director of public works, but I I'm afraid I can't be supportive of them. Thank you, Mr. Levy. Anything else, Mr. Ortel? Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I, you know, I'm a little ambivalent about the um, ordinance. Um, I, I know Pleasant Street had been mentioned tonight, that's in my ward, and uh, Pleasant Street has a gorgeous canopy of trees, goes from one end to the other. Anybody from out of town who comes to Danbury off of Park Avenue from the highway goes down Pleasant Street and says, my gosh, this is a really pretty town. Uh, people benefit from the um, arboration of Pleasant Street in a couple of different ways, from the environment, from the um, aesthetic values and things like that, but there is a cost to these things. And the cost is usually borne by the homeowner. I actually have a constituent on Pleasant Street. Oh, Mr. Tom, you just stand down for one second while you change the tape? I have a constituent on Pleasant Street whose um, sidewalks are cracked by the roots of these trees, and he's fully aware that he's responsible for maintaining those sidewalks. His point is that the damage or the age of the sidewalk has been prematurely um, aged by a no fault of his own, by these trees that are actually owned by the taxpayers or by the city, and he wants them cut down. I, I always talk him out of it every year, so we go through this little back and forth. But there is this cost, um, and you know we're thankful that people on Deer Hill and Oyana and Pleasant Street and West Worcester rake the leaves up off the sidewalk and clean it and police it on a regular basis. Um, and uh, it's not too much to ask for the taxpayers to, you know, pay to have the, their own, essentially, leaves picked up with vacuum trucks at the end of the season. Uh, this brings up another point about the um, present ordinance, because one of the issues that we heard this evening from Councilwoman Basso and from others uh, in the audience was that plows have a tendency of reburying sidewalks and driveways on a, on a fairly regular basis. It happens not just in Danbury, and I'm not uh, casting aspersions at the Public Works Department, who do a great job in Danbury and are noted for cleaning off the streets under extraordinarily difficult conditions sometimes, where some of these streets are so narrow they can't even get a plow down, so they have a little pickup truck that goes down and makes special runs. But the fact remains that um, you're uh, required by ordinance to clean off your sidewalk within four hours uh, after daylight at the end of a storm. And most people do, and then only to find out that at two or three in the afternoon they have to do it again. Kids can't walk down the sidewalk, they can't get mail, kids are in the gutter coming home from school because the plows have um, you know, redeposited ice and snow back on those sidewalks, not from the sky, but from the street. And one of the issues that I had with this ordinance was that it doesn't delineate that fact that happens, especially in downtown areas where you may not have a lot of space to get rid of your snow. You already shoveled the sidewalk once and created a nice little pile between the curb and the sidewalk. Plow comes over, buries that again, and you try to put it back up on that pile, and it rolls back down into your sidewalk. So you say, well, okay, you can't run it through a snowblower because it's too chunky, you just 
stick it back in the road. What I would like to see is something in the language of this ordinance that protects homeowners from removing snow that was put there by the city. Now, er earlier in the week, uh, I spoke to Corporation Council, and Corporation Council was nice enough to draft some language that I was comfortable with, but I also had a conversation with the Public Works Department, and the Public Works Department is not comfortable with that language. So we had a little, little back and forth today and decided that maybe what we should do is send it back to an ad hoc. And, and that's fine, and we can do that. Uh, but it was pointed out to me this afternoon that if we do do that, it's probably going to mean that the ordinance doesn't get passed until the end of the winter. And I don't think anybody wants to see that happen um, if these issues are as, as difficult as they seem to be. Um, I'm go going to support the ordinance. I, I know Councilman Saudi is coming up with uh, a little amendment that, that I will support if it doesn't mean it has to go back to public hearing. Uh, but I've been promised that uh, these issues that we were talking about this evening can be fixed, rectified in the next couple of months in other uh, ad hocs. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll get this ordinance on the books, and then we can come back and, and, and straighten this out and that out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Atala. Mrs. Stanley? Thank you, Mr. Cavo. I just want to make sure that the gentleman in the back's comment or question has been addressed about the snow plowing and pushing some of the snow out into the street when there's no place else for it to go and dispersing it along the street. Is that something that um, this threw you to Mr. Adarola? Do we have issues with this? I mean, I, I understand where we're worried about obstruction. Sometimes when we do have a heavy snow, um, sometimes there is no place for the snow to go. Uh, and you'll see something similar like downtown Main Street where the city, you know, kind of helps them out a little bit. Um, but there are a lot of places where there is no place for the snow to go, and the only place to do it is not really just pushing it out into the snow, but properly doing it. And I do want to give the contractors in the area, not all contractors do a bad job. A lot of them do a great job. The landscapers that take care of the leaves, I go by and see some of the yards that they do, and, and they vacuum up the leaves and don't leave a leaf not even in the road. So I, I, I hate to see the contractors get such a bad rap all the time. I just wanted to pull one out there for them. Well, it, it's a shame that a handful of contractors get exactly. the balance of the responsible contractors, the ones with common sense. Right. The key word here is common sense, folks. Okay? Common sense. It comes down to having a level of responsibility while you're conducting your business of removing snow to take the level of care not to impose the rest of the public or put the rest of the public in danger. What this gentleman is proposing in a situation where there's no opportunity to push the snow anywhere, but he's going to windrow it right back just like my plow drivers would, I don't have an issue with that. It's the drivers that come out of that driveway and five feet before they hit the gutter of the road, they raise their plow and they take off hitting the next gear, going down to the next job. And there's two, three feet of snow that gets pushed out into the road. Uh, sometimes it's a wet snow in a couple hours it freezes and we can't even push it off with some of the plows. So that's where we have to send out either a grader or we have to send out a loader. That's what we're talking about here. And um, if you will just allow me, I would like to just say that there's been a lot of discussion about snow, but this ordinance change is just not about snow. Um, snow is an easy example to kind of imagine in our minds, but um, most of the flooding that occurs during a storm, believe it or not, is directly related to catch basins being clogged by debris, uh, garbage. Um, believe it or not, in the springtime, people love to rake the first five to ten feet of their yard right into the gutter, and they'll leave nice little piles a foot, two feet high, um, waiting for our sweepers to come along and suck it up. Um, the very first heavy rain that all gets brought down to the low point or to a catch basin, clogs the catch basins. Uh, a lot of private properties are damaged by that type of an event. So that's an additional issue that, that comes to play here. Um, there are, uh, there's garbage, there's uh, demolition debris that gets left right on the edge of the road. Uh, there's large tree limbs that get left on the edge of the road, people thinking that, uh, you know, we would come in and remove that. So 
Uh, although snow is something that we can talk about, uh, this goes a little bit beyond uh, just snow. It goes uh, into keeping our gutters clean so we uh, have good gutter flow. Um, it, it comes down to that issue. Um, and, and let's face it, um, every time there's a flooding issue, uh, we get called out. And it's your tax dollars. Um, and it's not usually during working hours. It's usually on double time. Or it's during a holiday or a time and a half. Um, it's something that, as a manager, being responsible for a fairly large capital and operating budget, um, and we're getting pinched every year to try to just minimize our overtime, try to do a job with uh, a little less and do a little better job. Uh, this is just one area that I thought uh, we could um, collectively, um, you guys can help me try to control my overtime a little better. Um, and I'm going to sit down uh, for a minute, but I do want to say one other thing. I have a lot of respect for my plow drivers, and um, you don't realize what plowing snow is like until you've actually done it for a couple of years. It's blood money. Um, you're away from your family. Um, you're up. Sometimes these guys are napping right in their trucks. Uh, you're not eating well, uh, you're up for 30 hours only to be expected to come back in in the morning, same to schools, get everything ready. Uh, it's really not a glamorous job. Um, yeah, they get overtime, which is nice. In the middle of a snowstorm, these guys cannot wait for me to say it's time to go home um, because they're usually worn out and, and they're just about had it. So um, there's one thing I, I want to say to you. Um, I don't really, um, I don't really uh, take it kindly as a, a past elected official did tonight and complain about my snowplow drivers uh, plowing snow 15 feet into somebody's front porch. You have an issue, you get a call from one of your constituents regarding one of my plow drivers pushing snow 15 feet on a residential road, and I know where uh, this woman lives. You need to call me right away because it will be dealt with very quickly. Um, it's not good to come here six months after that snowplow driver did this um, and, in a public forum and do a little grandstanding, okay? Um, I am very responsible. You know a lot of you guys have called me about issues you've had with uh, my operations and I fixed it immediately. Uh, I'm a very responsive uh, manager, but I also have a lot of respect for my plow drivers and I have a hard time believing that somebody's going to push snow 15 feet onto somebody's porch. So if there's an issue, please call me. Tell me what street your constituent lives on. I'll immediately know who that plow driver is, and they will be warned. Or what we will do is actually send a foreman out with them to see how they're driving. Um, so please, call me right away. Let's not wait into November after uh, 10 months of... Uh, the winter being over uh, to complain about a snowplow driver. Uh, these guys work really hard, and I know quite a few uh, really know them, and you know what kind of work we do. And removing snow in this city is a difficult situation. Downtown is extremely complicated. Um, uh, up in the uh, you know more rural areas, it's not too bad, but it's quite an undertaking. And uh, if you can picture making some calls in a war room about when to put the plows on, a driver losing a truck, trying to find another driver to cover him, uh, somebody getting uh, sick in the middle of a plow run, um, uh, people getting uh, run off the road. It's a very difficult situation, and I, um, you know, I don't want to tell you about what kind of a job it is, but it's, it's probably the least desirable part of my job, um, and it's a difficult job. So thank you for listening to my... Uh, thank you, Ms. Anderone. Mr. Riley? Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I'd like to say to uh, Mr. Idarola that I don't think the issue here tonight is anything to do with, with the highway department, the city uh, department. The, I, I speak for myself, and I always do. I have nothing but admiration for what the department does. But at the same, at the same token, at the same token, one must remember that if 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 you speak out, if you speak out against what you feel in your heart might not be a good ordinance, then uh, so be it. 
and, and I don't think it's a question. I don't think it's a question that that myself. I'm going to vote against it, but it's not the question of voting against the highway department and and saying things that they they might not be doing this or might not be doing that. It's not that issue at all. So I just want to have an understanding regarding that because, you know, if if all due respect to you, and I do have a lot of respect for you, if if one decides to vote against something that you vehemently want, I'm under the obligation of the oath I took to 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 look at this and in my heart vote the way I feel is is right. So I. I even though I vote no, that doesn't mean that I, I don't hold your department in high esteem, which I do. So I just want to clarify it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rennie. Mrs. Stanley, you had your hand up. I also want to say I think you you do a phenomenal job. <laughs> and and um, I also, I'm going to vote in favor of this. I think he answered my questions. Um, and uh, I, I think we do have safety concerns that need to be addressed, and I'm supporting it. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Mr. Arconti. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Idirola, how much money do you think it costs us in fixing some of the problems we discussed this evening in overtime and all? I've... Uh, I know it's a tough question. Yeah, it's, it's a tough question. Um, send a truck back out or a loader back out because some plow truck driver leaves a big pile in the street, say on Cahansa Street, for example, I know you've done that there. Yes, we have. How much money does it cost us? Well, this is what ends up happening is um, usually the guys after completing their snow plow, after being out for 26 hours and they've already clocked in a considerable amount of overtime, will get a phone call, typically from the police department saying the road is, is uh, unpassable. Uh, four hour minimum time, um, and typically it's an operator, uh, a truck driver, and a typically a foreman. Um, so. Yeah, it could easily run you in a thousand dollars at a clip every time they go out. Last year, guys went out, went home. About an hour and a half later, we have to call them back out. Um, that's another thousand dollars. It's another, and that's the reason why it drove me to try to do something about this issue because I just saw my overtime money just every time this happened. I was we're into tens of thousands of dollars very easily in one winter, easily. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. That's all I need to know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the language I'm thinking about in subsection G, and I'd like to, uh, through the chair, put this to Corporation Council uh, from two perspectives. One, I'm hoping that it's not considered substantive in a sense where it deviates from anything within the ordinance, but just simply clarifies things. And with the indulgence of the council, that would allow us uh, to go forward without having to go to another public hearing. Uh, and again, even though the issue here, as I understand it, is not to overlap with other statutes or ordinances that address the issue of obstructions, I think that inherently is part of the issue here, is interference or obstruction. And I know from, I believe from a statutory standpoint, obstruct literally means to you know, prevent or block, but we're not talking about absolutely blocking off a road, but where something may obstruct or interfere with a portion of travel. So the, the, the language I'm thinking about in G would be after the word uh, debris on that first line to insert the following uh, that obstructs, may obstruct or otherwise interfere with safe passage upon, comma, or otherwise interfere with the regular and proper maintenance or drainage of, and then continue on the rest of, the, uh, of that sentence. And, and the reason I, I structured in that way was trying to do two things. Uh, one was to address the issue of people who just momentarily or temporarily, as I admit doing many times when I was cleaning leaves, is lining them up along the side and then going and collecting the whole row and bagging it and putting it uh, on my property. So you would probably cull out those that are temporary, very temporary uh, issues that we're really not trying to target here, as well as, again, getting back to the issue of the actual interference with any either maintenance, drainage, or passage upon the public thoroughfare or public property or sidewalk. So that's what I would present. I don't put it in the form of a motion yet because I don't want to go back and forth on motions. I wanted to throw the language out there to see if there's anything that jumps out one way or another through the chair. Uh, let me address it this way. Uh, Mr. Riley said he had high esteem for the Public Works Department. As long as you indicate you have high esteem for ours, 
I can indicate to you. The lawyers? <laughs> well, no. For, As one. For us. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it seems, uh, all joking aside, Councilman, that, that that is probably an acceptable amendment um, because it comes within the implication of the ordinance. Uh, so, yes. And if I may, as I said before, through the chair to the director of public works, I can read the body language a little bit, but I just want to make sure again, that, is that something, I don't want to create a problem here. I'd rather just, you know, if I'm going to vote against this, just vote against it rather than inserting language that's going to create a problem. So. No, that, that um, is, okay. is more of a clarification than anything else. Okay. So. so if I may at this time, then I would like to make a motion to amend um, the ordinance as proposed for recommendation to the council as a whole as stated, but I'll reread it again. In subsection G, after the word debris, insert the following. That obstructs, comma, may obstruct, or otherwise interfere with safe passage upon, comma, or otherwise interfere with the regular and proper maintenance or drainage of, and then continue with the rest. To the extent that there's any, uh, just, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that's my amendment. Okay. okay. If I may continue on the discussion, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure. If I may continue. Yes, please. Uh, and I, I don't dictate that language. If there's words that make more sense in the context of the statute and tracking the language, I would defer uh, to Corporation Council. But you, I think you understand the, the essence hereof. We, we can do that, Councilman. Second. Thank you. Is there already been seconded by Mr. Chief? Okay. okay, the amendment under discussion. On the amendment only under discussion, Mrs. Keischultz? Um, I, this is just a question of clarification um, through the chair, I guess, to Corporation Council. This won't have to go back to public hearing because it's substantive, correct? Uh, it's, I mean, it, it, will it have to go back to public hearing or not? I'm just clarifying so everybody's on the same right. page. No, no problem. Uh, as, as I indicated to Councilman Saudi, it would not have to go back to public hearing because we consider this a de minimis amendment that it's, it's essentially a clarification that's within the ordinance now as proposed. Uh, anything else under discussion on the amendment? I, I would like to just, oh, Mr. Rattel. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this amendment. It's, it's uh, a lot more than I even hoped for we could get in an ad hoc. And I have to tell you, I've got constituents who are already reshoveling their sidewalks and, and being refined on top of the reshoveling. There may be an expense in dealing with contractors who are putting tons of snow in the road, but believe me, there's an expense dealing with um, uh, uh, snow from the street that winds up on your sidewalk after a storm too. And most downtown properties cost about 75 bucks for each time you do it. And if you have to do it three or four times, um, it, it adds up pretty quickly per storm. So. This is something I'm very comfortable with. I think it, it focuses the uh, ordinance. Uh, Public Works gets what it wants. I think the constituents get what they want. And, and I, this is a very good compromise. It's a win-win. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Teller. I was going to uh, say the same comments. I think that the amendment uh, just helps to clarify um, the obstruction of the road. And that's basically what we were trying to achieve here was to stop the obstruction of roads. So, I will be in support of the amendment as well, and uh, I thank Mr. Shadi for being able to put that together on the fly. Any other discussion, Mr. Levy? Is this a discussion under the amendment? It is the discussion under the amendment. I, you know, I, I think the amendment is a good amendment, and it clarifies the, the debris, but I still have a problem with putting the onus or responsibility on the property owner. Um, I just think that... Um, well, the, Mr. Mr. Levy, if we, I think we go back on, under discussion after the amendment, we can certainly talk about that again if you'd like. Okay. Anything else on the amendment? Seeing none, I'll try your minds. All those in favor of the proposed amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay. Back to the main motion under discussion. Mr. Levy, did you want to, for the second time, just talk about your yeah I, I have a I, I think that when a, an individual hires a contractor he expects that contractor to perform uh, functions uh, within the uh, within the scope of the law and uh, I think whoever that individual is whether it's the property owner or a professional hired contractor uh, if there's a penalty to be paid 
it should be paid by the individual that caused the hazard or the obstruction. I don't think that the wording, uh, the wording here squarely puts it on the property owner and uh, I would like to see that change to the individual that caused the hazard. Okay. Well, I, would, I will tell you, Mr. Levy, that at the ad hoc committee meeting, that did come up as discussion, and we had had some lengthy discussion about that. And it was my feeling, and then in the end, I believe it was the feeling of the committee, that this makes it very unenforceable if you have to chase a plow driver down for who's done a driveway and left the snow out in the road. I think that if you get the homeowner and the homeowner gets the warning, it's the homeowner's responsibility to pass that warning to their plow driver before the next time they plow that driveway to say, I will be fined if you block the city streets with the snow from my driveway, so please don't do it. If you do it again, you certainly wouldn't get paid by me if it was my driveway, and you wouldn't be back the next time to plow my driveway. So I think that for the enforceability, the committee, the, the committee looked at it from that standpoint because we did discuss this and we did hash that out. And you have contractors that come into town that you don't, you, from New York, how are you going to enforce a $90 fine on a contractor of New York if he continually does it? So when the homeowner is responsible and since the homeowner hires him, it's the same thing, and I said this in the committee, you hire somebody to do your gutters, put your gutters on your house. If they don't do it right, are you going to pay them? You're not going to pay them. If you hire them to do contracting work in your house, paint, side it, roof it, if it's not done right, are you going to pay them? You're not going to pay them until they do the job properly. And it comes to the same thing with hiring a plow operator or someone that does your leaves. If they're not doing the job properly, they need to do it to your satisfaction in order to get their compensation for that work. And you ultimately need to be the responsible party for that. So that, that did come up. Well, I, I thank you, Mr. President, for, uh, for um, uh, clarifying that portion of it. I, I still have a problem with um, just the mere fact that, that these are things that can be resolved. And I, I listened and I am very uh, sensitive to the, um, the trials and tribulations of driving a snowplow uh, during a winter storm and trying to be, drive this huge massive piece of equipment and dodging back and forth between cars and, and every other obstacle going along with ice and speed sometime is a requirement uh, it's if you're going to be adequately plow an area so how far that snow goes it's it's not always uh, something that can be calculated. I completely understand that, Mr. Lee. And uh, as far as the money and the cost of that, uh, we, we have problems, and uh, that always happens in a storm. I mean, we're asking our public works director to uh, to look at his crystal ball and call, call in the whole crew at times uh, based on what weather predictions are, and sometimes they never materialize. Um, so it's not... Uh, you know, you, you can call in a whole crew for a snow that never materialized, and taxpayers have to bear the cost, and and it's to be expected. And some of the other things that occur afterwards, and I think that part of the protocol, a certain number of people are left on standby, um, even when the crew goes home, that can take care of those unconscionable people that create these hazards in the road. So I, I still haven't changed Thank my Thank you, mind. Mr. Lee. Mr. Stanley, no, you know, Mr. Stanley, you've had three shots at this. I'm sorry, <laughs> Mr. Curran. Okay, questions being called. Are we calling the amendment question? No, the amendment's already been okay. voted on and passed. Remember. Okay. Um, do we have a second on calling the question. So does that mean I could speak? Mr. Nagashev, second it. Okay, on the motion to call the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Uh, we better have a roll call vote on that, please. Okay, this is not calling the question. Mm -hmm. Mayor? Yes. Nagashev? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Um, no. Chili? No. Mr. Vito? No. Scotty? No. Cabo? Yes. Costello? No. 
yeses, seven noes on calling the question. The motion passes to call the question. Now to vote, try your minds on the uh, adoption of, or the progressing of the ordinance to the council in next month's meeting. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That was on the main motion. As amended. As amended. Okay, so we have 16, 16 yeses and one no. Two no's. Oh, Mr. Riley, no also. Two no's. Mr. Levy. Mr. Levy and Mr. Riley voted no on the same motion. Simple majority by your uh, ordinance. Simple majority. On to item number five. And Mr. Alpern has been sitting here so patiently, and I'm sorry, Mr. Alpern, that your item wound up to be number five instead of number one tonight, but you can talk to the city clerk about that. Um, I was wondering, Mr. Alpern, if you would come up and just give us a little background um, on this for the council and the public benefit. Um, where shall I begin? Hey, take us down that long and windy road. That you 20 years ago, when I first came here, I re and I'm in charge of preparing a capital improvement program for the city, a five-year program, I received a request from public uh, buildings uh, for monies to improve these murals that are in the old library. That was 20 years ago. It was a small amount of money. We made the recommendation through the Planning Commission, and it wasn't funded. And it came through year after year after year, and we kept proposing it over and over and over again, and um, it's never been funded. Now we have an opportunity, because through the Certified Local Government Program, if it's approved by the state, we can get a 50-50 matching grant from the state to make these improvements. And that's basically what is before you today. It is an ordinance that would allow us to proceed. Uh, once this is uh, completed, the mayor would form an historic properties commission, which is made up of five regular members and three alternates. They would have, that list would have to come back to you for confirmation. Then they would meet um, and prepare all the necessary documentation to apply to the state. Okay, that's what it is. And it only pertains to the old library. It is a very long, involved process. Um, my guess is primarily because in most cases it would apply to a district which would include private property, and that's why it's so extensive. And this ordinance needs to be in effect in order for us to apply for the funding from... Yes, it does. Okay. Does anybody on the council have any questions for Mr. Elpern regarding number five? Mr. Kern? Yeah, Dennis, did you say it was a 50-50 match? Yes. When, where would the 50% the, the would have to come from us? Yes. And do we have it? I'm sorry? Do we have it? I, I, well, it would, that would be approximately $17,000. Uh, enough to call out seven trucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
that's the only re the question I asked. I, I, well, of course, it would have to come back to you for approval of the expenditure of funds. Yes, and certification. I think and I think all of that, that this ha certain things have to be in place first in order for. Okay. And, and I think that the mayor would probably come and talk to us about funding in the future if he doesn't get a grant or um, yes. somebody else to step up and uh, kick in money to help preserve your library. At the rate we've been going on this, it'll be in next year's budget, I'm sure. Not this year's. Any other questions? Mr. Rotel? Uh, yeah, if I may, just to clarify, by accepting this ordinance, yeah. we will not be bound no, to spend the not. money this no, year, next year, not. or any other year, but it will allow us, should we happen to find $17,000, to yeah. be able to do this. Precisely. It will not be required, correct? Thank okay. you. Anything else? On item number five? Seeing none, I'll try your minds. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Anybody opposed? There was no agreed. motion made for that? Oh, I'm sorry. But uh, I'm sorry. But while we're doing that, I'll, I can do the motion. Second. What was your motion, Mr. Nagashev? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to move to receive the uh, report of the Historical Property Study Committee and recommend the adoption of the Historic Property Ordinance Section 4-1 and designating uh, 254 Main Street as a historic property pursuant to Second. Thank you. I heard that one to Mr. Rotella. You've been pretty sharp tonight, Ms. McMahon, but Mr. Rotella was in my better ear, so. Uh, Mr. Levy, I'm sorry, under discussion? Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to thank Mrs. Uh, Weinstein for uh, her work and, and Dennis Alpern for his work in in um, identifying these historical locations and, and preserving them because once they're gone, they're gone forever. And the Marian Anderson uh, Music Hall, the Denver is a, uh, an outstanding starting point for uh, restoration. Thank you, and thank you for And recognition should also go to Robin Edwards. Okay, and we thank the council, thanks Ms. Yeah. Edwards as well, and you, Ms. Ms. Alpern, Ms. Winston, thank you. Okay, now I'll try your minds on this, I'm sorry. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Motion carries unanimously. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Johnson's made that. Mr. Nagashev has seconded it. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion.